Well, folks, again, um, if you've never heard uh, Pastor Brother Glenn speak, you're in for a treat. If you have, you know uh, what to expect. He's, he's a man that is hard after God's heart, and I so appreciate him, and, and uh, i got to get you a microphone. Come on up, my brother. We are so glad that you're here. Hallelujah. It's good to be here. Glad you all made it. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, do you know you got a good pastor? Okay. Make sure you take care of him. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you now in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask for your blessing on this word. Give us ears to hear. And Lord, we pray that you'd speak to us according to our spiritual condition and you'd help us to understand that we might respond correctly. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Well, you can turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Um, it's interesting when you look at the people that Jesus praised, because in Scripture you don't find that he praised very many people. And when you look at the people that he praised, uh, it's really just in two categories, uh, according to their faith or according to their devotion. And so the two people that Jesus praised according to their faith, uh, both of them were Gentiles or non-Jews which is really an extraordinary thing because he praises them for their faith. And even with the centurion, he says that he hasn't seen faith like that in all of Israel. So he had greater faith than the apostles, than any of the disciples, uh, any of them that really ultimately came right after. Uh, he had greater faith. And so that's a pretty astounding statement there. Um, and the similar thing is with the Canaanite woman. She had great faith, and that's who we're going to be looking at this evening uh, the other people that Jesus uh, praised, or let's say the other person that Jesus praised, was over great devotion. And you have two expressions of it from the same woman, which was Mary. One time was when uh, she was sitting at the feet of Jesus and uh, just uh, being absorbed, consumed with him while her sister Mary was being busy about all kinds of business, and he praised her for that devotion. But then the second time was just before Christ's crucifixion when Jesus uh, was anointed by her and uh, that she had expressed this extravagant devotion. And uh, so he praised the woman for, for that. Um, it's interesting that you don't have any, uh, any Jewish men being praised. You know, I mean, how many of us in the church would make the list that Jesus would actually praise? Uh, would any of us make that list? Would we be numbered among those who have great faith or those who have great devotion? Would any of us be numbered among that? And that's something I think we need to look at because it may be that we've settled too much for mediocrity, for this status quo, this easy uh, kind of Christianity, and not really understood what it was to uh, follow Jesus the way that he calls us to. So we're going to be looking at the Canaanite woman. And uh, this is a phenomenal account that's here. And uh, she was a Canaanite. The Greek would be from uh, that she came from Tyre or Sidon, and uh, others would other translations refer to as a as a Phyro Phoenician. So she was a descendant of the Canaanites, and as a descendant of the Canaanites, the Canaanites were pagans. Uh, the Syrophoenicians were pagans, but the Canaanites they had some very evil practices that they did: child uh, sacrifice and so on. And so she came from a very idolatrous. Background, So we have to understand where she came from. She may be in Israel at this point and uh, seeking after Jesus, but she had a background that was uh, in paganism and all the darkness that she might have been involved in. We're not told what she was involved in, but we have to understand from her pagan background that she was involved in some stuff. And as we will see, um, it had to open up the demon possession of her daughter. 
And uh, so I'll touch on that in just a moment. But she heard, she heard of Jesus and went out and sought after him. And as we're going to see in a minute as well, this woman had to seek out enough information about Jesus to know some things about him that the Pharisees wouldn't even acknowledge. And so I think that's very interesting. This woman just didn't go to Jesus because Jesus was in the area. She went after Jesus, wanted to know who is he, you know, what's he going to do, can he help me? Is he the one that can really answer my problems? Can he really solve the issues that I'm having? And so she heard that Jesus was there and she sought after him. Um, She wasn't waiting for Jesus to seek after her. Now, I would say already that God was seeking after. You have this this, uh, theological idea of provenient grace, which is grace that takes place before salvation that leads a person to salvation. So obviously the Holy Spirit was already working on this woman, drawing her, but yet he's looking at this woman, seeking after him. And that becomes a very important thing to be people that begin to seek after him because we desire him, we want to know him, we want to enter into that place of fellowship. So she comes up to him, and what I would venture to say is going on is that Jesus is probably taking a break from a time of ministry, which he had to, because otherwise people would be pressing on him nonstop, and, and, uh, you know, he was God incarnate, but he had a real human body, and so he got tired. And he needed to eat and have some rest and so on. So I'm guessing that this is probably some lull in his ministry teaching time. And so he's kind of being protected by the disciples that are around him to keep the people that would want to be pressing upon him from doing that. So he'd keep them at at bay until Jesus would get himself back into uh, preaching, teaching, and, and, uh, and healing people. And so what happens, she is a little distance, and I don't think it's a, a, a big distance. I think it's just a little because Jesus could hear her speak. But he, she ends up saying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My little daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Now, the thing that she ends up saying, which is very astounding for a Gentile, a non-Jew, to acknowledge that Jesus was of the lineage of King David. That's really quite astounding because the Pharisees didn't do that, and the Pharisees knew it. You understand? They knew the reality of his lineage. They knew it because the moment he came on the scene and he started gaining in popularity, I guarantee they went and researched him, and they looked at who is this Jesus, what tribe is he of, what family is he of, and as they pursued it, they found that he was of the tribe of Judah, of the family of King David. So they they found these things out, and never did they acknowledge it. Never did they acknowledge it. They denied it constantly. But yet here you have this Gentile woman that is acknowledging the reality of who Jesus is. And this is an astounding thing because she had to get the information from whatever source it was. So she had to somehow learn about this. So I would venture to say she's talking to other people, talking to some Jewish people, finding out about this Jesus, what's going on, what's he doing. Why is all these things happening through him? And she came to the knowledge that he was of the lineage of King David. And her statement there, that son of David, is really saying, Jesus, you have the right to be the king of Israel. I'm acknowledging your rightful place. If Israel isn't doing it, I'm acknowledging it. Because I understand at least a little bit from what is being said about you who you are. So she had a problem. She said, my little girl... My daughter, and that word in the Greek is going to be little. It's going to be a a small one, two, three, four years old. And so you have this little girl that is demon-possessed, and she is suffering terribly from it. So I would venture to say there's a lot here that all we can do is speculate on, but I think some of the speculation is reasonable. She must have went to the doctors in her hometown. She must have went and asked them what the problem was. She must have went, since they couldn't do anything for this little girl, went to the religious leaders that she uh, was in touch with and maybe went to some that she wasn't, hoping that somebody might have some kind of cure. So I don't doubt in the least she even went into that which was the demonic, trying to find some form of remedy for this girl. And it may have been, you know, going to some pagan exorcist or, or somebody in one of the pagan cults that, that acknowledge the reality, well, your daughter is demon-possessed, that's what the problem is. And so somehow she came to the knowledge that the problem the daughter was having was demon possession and nobody could help her. Nobody could help her. 
And so this woman was, was watching her daughter suffer terribly. And for all of you that have been parents, especially for you mothers, you know what it is to agonize over your child when you're seeing your child suffer. That little one that you're seeing, whether it's a cold, whether it's some flu, whether it's some terrible uh, sickness a child's going through, you are suffering with that child. It is agonizing on your heart. And as a Christian, you understand some things better than what a non-Christian, but mothers normally love their children, right? Pagan or not, they love their children. Now, of course, as Christians, we can learn how to love more purely, more selflessly than what what non-Christians can, but a mother will love her children. And so here's this mother that's loving her daughter, seeing her daughter being tormented miserably, and we're not told what that it was. We're not told the expressions of it, but there had to be some form of outward expression of torment that was coming upon her from the demon possession that was somehow abusing her or she was abusing herself or whatever is taking place. And so a miserable thing. And so she comes to Jesus, and the first thing she did is she acknowledged Jesus' authority. Lord, son of David. She acknowledged his authority. She acknowledged, you are the son of David, but with all this, she was coming to him not because she wanted to hear a sermon. She was coming to him because she was acknowledging the miracles that he had, that she had seen him perform and that she had heard about. Maybe she was in that crowd that Jesus had been speaking to and was waiting for the opportunity to try and break through the crowd to get to Jesus. And maybe this was the first opportunity that she had to try and get there. So she acknowledged the authority of Jesus. You know, nobody can become a follower of Jesus until they acknowledge his authority to save. I mean, this is something that people have to come to. They may not understand the Trinity and all the other dynamics. They may not get some deep theological grasp of all the truths about who this God is that we can know, but they have enough to know that here is Jesus and he is able to save me from my sins. Until we're willing to acknowledge that, then guess what? We're never going to come to salvation. But even as Christians, until we really grab a hold of this, how are we going to go any further in our Christian life? And so we have to understand the authority of Jesus. And if I begin to understand the authority of Jesus, I have this problem now. Either I'm going to submit to his authority or rebel against it. So if I understand who Jesus is, and if I understand that he's God, and that he's able to do the things he said that he did, so either I am going to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to submit to your ways, I'm going to do what you call me to do, I'm going to obey you, or we're going to say no. And so we're brought to the place that we have to make a decision with it. But then she said the next thing, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Very powerful little thought that's there, have mercy. You never ask for mercy until you see your need of mercy. If everything's going well, you're not going to cry for mercy. People that think everything is going well, isn't, they're not going to cry out for mercy. You know, so I live in an RV, and uh, we have a little house now, which we've had just for a little over a year. But prior to that, 25 years, we lived down the road. You know, some of the hardest people to reach are RVers, especially those in retirement, because they're living for play. They're living for, for pleasure. They don't want anybody telling them that they're in danger of hellfire. They're not open to it. Until we see the need, we're not going to cry out for mercy. That's why when you look at the church, you see all these people that went through nightmares. They had to somehow come to the place to see their need. They had to somehow come to the place to see that they were a sinner in need of a Savior, and they were finally willing to cry out for God to rescue them. And so that's how people enter into salvation. They have to come to that knowledge. But it's not just for those who are needing to come to salvation This is something extremely important for Christians because we will not go any further in our Christian life until we understand our neediness, until we become people that are desperately pursuing God. And this is something that is is of the utmost importance in the church if we really want to see a move of God, if we really want to have a measure of revival. We have to see our own neediness and the neediness of the church and the neediness of those around us or we're not going to give ourselves to prayer and seeking after God and crying out like people that are desperate. Desperate people act in desperate ways, which is the normal response for a desperate situation. And until we are desperate, we're not going to pay the price 
to see God do anything great other than what would be conveniently inconvenient. You know, will be inconvenienced a little bit to a certain point, but if it's too much, well, now you're asking too much of me, and I don't think I'm going to want to give that much. But she had to. She had to come to the place to cry for mercy. Now, I, now we need to understand a dimension here. This woman was not Jewish, and she had come to what she understood as a Jewish prophet. I don't think she understood his divinity in the least. I don't think she had even the, 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 the slightest inclination of it, but she knew that Jesus was a prophet, and she believed that he was a son of David and had the right to the throne of Israel. So she had believed to that particular point, and so there's something that's very important with that. But she had to come to the point to see her need. And that's a very painful process. I don't doubt that, like I said earlier, that she went to the doctors of her village or hometown that she was in, that she went to the religious people of the whatever religion that she had to be immersing herself in because they'll have one primary idol that they'll worship, but they'll have all these other little idols that they'll, they'll be uh, not worshipped to the same extent as their principal idol. And so she may have went to all these things. And imagine a non-Jew that's a pagan worshiper that is normally the relationship between the Jew and the Gentile there or the Phoenician or the Canaanite is going to be very hostile. Okay, you would see the normal situation of people in their pride. So they're normally proudful, one nationality against another nationality. And so you have this woman coming to the end of herself, being willing finally to humble herself to go to the Jewish prophet. That's bigger than you and I under our understanding. This is huge because she had to leave her hometown. She had to leave from where she was from. She had to go and acknowledge, my people don't have an answer for this. She had to lay aside her nationality, her national pride, and all the things that go with that and say, I've got to go to the only one I've heard that is able to do anything about anybody that is demon-possessed, and he happens to be a Jewish prophet. So I'm going to go to Israel. I'm going to seek him out till I find him because he's the only one that can help me. And so what we see here is not just the aspect of seeing her desperation, but humbling herself enough to seek Jesus no matter what the price would be. Because can you imagine what some of the people would be saying if she went to family and friends and says, well, I'm going to go into Israel and I'm going to look for the Jewish prophet. Do you think they'd say, oh, go for it? Or you think that they'd be attacking her, tearing into her because that was not a good thing to do. So she'd have opposition from her own people. She'd have opposition, I guarantee you, from hell trying to inwardly have battles to keep her from going. All these struggles that would be going on, we're going to see the struggles are still yet to come. But she acknowledged her need. And then she acknowledged her responsibility in making the problem. Now, this is serious. What I'm going to say here is, is very serious. Demon possession is similar to what it is for a person to become a Christian. They have to invite Jesus in their heart to become a Christian. People have to somehow invite the devil in their life to be demon-possessed. Devils do not have the right by God. They do not have the right to possess somebody unless that person opens up to that possession. All right? So this is an important thing. It's not normal for a little child to be demon-possessed. It's not normal. It's not what happens. So how did this child get demon-possessed? This is important stuff right here. It was the atmosphere she was living in. It was the life mama was living. It's what mother was doing that opened the door for the daughter to become demon-possessed. We're not told the lifestyle that she lived. We're not told what kind of immorality she was in. But whatever it was, it had become something that this little girl looked at and thought was normal. And from a little girl's standpoint, seeing mommy, what mommy's doing, it must be right. And then opening herself up to the demonic. And as we're going to see in this account, as we continue through this, we are going to have to really realize that Jesus is doing something for this woman that is extremely loving. 
Because if he doesn't deal with mama, casting the devil out of the daughter would be worthless because they'll just come back and they'll come back seven times worse. So Jesus has to deal with the woman because until the woman's changed, the atmosphere in the home won't be changed. And if the atmosphere in the home isn't changed, the same atmosphere that produced the demon possession will be there. What kind of atmosphere you have in your home? Do you understand? You have a spiritual climate, a spiritual atmosphere in your home. What is it? Is it filled with fear, depression, worldliness, consumed with, with, with TV and, and, and YouTube and all kinds of garbage in this stuff? You're creating a spiritual atmosphere in your home. And if you don't understand that, you've opened yourself up then to some demonic things that is taking place, activity in your home, that may not bring possession, maybe it will down the road, if you keep giving yourself up to it, but it may bring depression, it may bring anxiety and fear, it may bring all this negative stuff that comes right from the pit of hell, because an atmosphere has been created in a home that is negative, that is destructive, that is harmful, rather than one that is filled with the praise and worship and presence of Jesus. How many times do people really think about the atmosphere of their home? You turn on TV, you turn on garbage on, the, uh, on, uh, on your uh, phone or computer, and you're bringing an atmosphere from hell right in. You're bringing it in, you're letting it in your home. It is defining who you are. It is affecting you more than you understand. Christians don't comprehend this. That's why they watch so much filth. I'm being honest here. They watch so much filth. How many of you get up in the morning, you turn the television on, and it's on all day long? You are constantly having over the airwaves into your home a spiritual atmosphere that is going to produce a spiritual effect upon you. And if you don't change the atmosphere, then what's going on isn't going to change. It'll only get worse. That's serious stuff. There's a lot, a lot of depression in the church. And do people take the time to really get behind it all? Because there's a lot of wrong thinking that's producing the depression. And they go to the world to get an answer, which the answer of the world is psychotropic drugs. And psychotropic drugs are, are destructive. They're worse than street drugs. So people create an atmosphere in their home, and they don't even comprehend what they're doing. And then they don't know how to get out of it because they have this atmosphere they're in constantly because they don't have an atmosphere of praise and worship. They have one of depression, fear, anxiety, worldliness, worldly ambition, anger, bitterness. She acknowledged her responsibility. She took responsibility for what was going on. And nothing nothing will change in our life for good. Nothing will change in our life for good until we're willing to accept responsibility for where we're at. That's serious stuff. So I've been in ministry for over 40 years. And uh, I've done a little bit of marital counseling over that time. And I can tell you, as a fact, a husband and wife that will sit down before me for marital counseling, and all they'll do is blame each other. It's worthless. My time, they're wasting my time. Go home. Get out of here. I can't do anything for you. Because as long as they're going to blame each other, they're never going to look at themselves. They're never going to look in the mirror. They're never going to see what they are doing and how they are destroying their marriage, how they are creating an atmosphere that is from hell. They're not going to take the time to do it because all they can do is blame the other person rather than look in the mirror and see the reality of what's going on inside of them and the problem that they are. They can point the finger at the spouse and say, you need to change and look at this in your life. Look at that in your life. Instead of looking in the mirror and say, God, there's some really ugly stuff in me. I can't change my spouse, but dear God, I can cry out for change in me. And until we accept responsibility, there can be no change, no change for the good. There can be change for the bad. You can get deeper and deeper. You can get yourself stuck deeper and deeper in the spiritual quagmire that you're in, but you're not going to change for good. And so this woman came to see her need. This old preacher, I believe he was from the 1600s, he made this really powerful statement. Listen closely. A man must feel himself in misery before he will go about to find a remedy. Be sick before he will seek a physician. Be in prison before he will seek a pardon. 
A sinner must be weary of his former wicked ways before he will run to Jesus. He must be sensible of his spiritual poverty and slavery under the devil before he will take up Christ's sweet and easy yoke. He must be cast down, confounded, condemned, a castaway, and lost in himself before he will look about for a Savior. Now, nobody can come to Christ until these things start happening in their life, that they begin to see themselves a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. But you know what? Christians cannot go any further in their life until they start allowing brokenness to come into their life, until they start allowing Jesus to break into their life and begin to expose what's inside of them, the lack of desire, the lack of passion, the lack of desperation, the, the lukewarmness, and all the other things that so easily get a hold of us until we're willing to deal with it, there can be no change. And so we go on being and doing what we've been year after year instead of understanding that this Christian walk is to be one that is a perpetual maturing, growing more and more, going from glory to glory to glory, that we do it constantly because we're pursuing him more and more. But you know what happens so, long, so often is instead of getting a greater fire and stoking a greater fire in our life, we get colder and colder as time goes on. And uh, I just want to say this very carefully is it so easy for us to do us as we get older? I paid my dues. I just don't have the same energy. And we let the fire of God go out. But you know what's so scary? The older we get, the closer to eternity we are. And I'll tell you what. The older you are, you should have a fire raging inside of you. The last thing you should be doing is letting it go out. Scary time. Understand. That's scary stuff because you could come to a place to breathe your last and you'll stand before Jesus then. And if you don't have a fire in you, what are you going to say? Well, you know, I was pretty old, Lord. Uh, What does that have to do with anything? Right? You might not move as fast as you did. That just means you have a a posture where you can be a man or woman of prayer beyond anything you've ever been if you shut your television off, if you cut the cable off, if you got rid of YouTube and, uh, and, and all the other things that you're subscribed to, is if you went and gave yourself to prayer, you might see God do some phenomenal things. But do we think it's important enough? Are we desperate for a move of God that will give ourselves to him that much, that we will desire to such an extent that we'll take hours and a day in prayer and seeking after God because we know there is no other remedy for our country, no other remedy for our nation? Because until we get to that place, until we are desperate, we're going to change nothing. And we should be growing more desperate, but the world has been speaking and we've been listening. And instead of growing more desperate, we're growing more comfortable. And so what happens, here's this woman that is now beginning to cry to Jesus. and She's outside this rim of disciples that is keeping her away from Jesus. But she's not going to be deterred. And so she's crying out, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. But it tells us that Jesus did not say a word, didn't say a word. So if he was eating, he continued to eat. If he was resting, he sat there with his eyes closed or whatever. it is. He totally ignored her. He heard her, but he ignored her. Is he being mean here? Is Jesus being mean? He is out to accomplish something in this woman's life that cannot be accomplished another way. So he's going to take this event, he's going to use it to produce something in this woman that is necessary. But you have to see a little bit of what this desperation is because she doesn't give up. The silence had an outward appearance of rejection, right? You're crying out to Jesus and he's ignoring you. At first glance, he is rejecting me. And you know what would happen with so many people? I'm just being honest here. If you all of a sudden says, okay, Jesus, I'm going to start speaking. I'm just going to start praying more. And, and if you don't hear something from him right away, you're going to stop. Because you're not really desperate. You see, she was desperate. She knew there was an answer no other place. So she had to. She had to seek after Jesus. What, like, like I said, what so many people would do is, well, if he's going to be like that, then I'm out of here. Well, he certainly can't be a man of God, a prophet of God. Look at him, I'm crying out, and he didn't even answer me. Right? How many people have gotten angry at God because they didn't understand what God was trying to do? They weren't willing to persevere through, but they sure were willing to blame God for not jumping the moment 
they spoke. And instead of understanding what the silence of God is about, they misunderstood it and got angry at him. And so I'm glad to say this woman didn't do it. And as we will see as we continue going, that she had a, a, a tenacious spirit. She was willing to persevere through. She was willing to fight through all that seems so negative because she was desperate. So what is the silence of God? There's a lot of ways that it can be understood. I'm going to take just a couple of ideas here and, and move on. But the first one is probably the most serious. The silence of God is often over the issue of sin. Why should he answer you? If you're not walking right with Jesus, why should he answer you? Not just that, if you're not walking right with Jesus, if he answered your prayers, you would think that everything was okay. And you continue in the same identical thing. says, well, I pray he answers my prayer, so everything must be okay. Well, I guess he's not bothered by the sin I'm in, by what I'm doing. And so he's silent. A very interesting verse is in Psalms chapter 50, verse 21. The Lord is speaking. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you. But I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Now, what's going on here is he's accusing the people of reducing God to manageable terms by making God like them. And he's not like them. He says, you thought I was like you? You are totally wrong. I am not like you. You've got to understand, I am totally other. I created you in my image. I was not created in yours. And so we try to reduce God to manageable terms, but it can't be done. God will not conform to our ideas, our theology, our opinions, or anything else. But there's a military term in here that's very scary. That phrase, and set them in order before your eyes. This military phrase was very typical for that day and age in which they battled. So how did they normally battle? One army would be on one side of a hill, another army on the other side, and they would rush down in ranks, rows upon rows of men, and they would have hand-to-hand combat in the valley. So what the Lord is saying is, I am setting an army against you. Each of your sins is becoming a soldier that is put in array against you. One next to another, next to another, row upon row upon row. And if you don't deal with your sin, they are going to march upon you and be your utter ruin. Terrifying verse, really. So the silence of God we should take very seriously. Are you being silent because there's sin in my life? Now, if there isn't, then we can move on from there and try and look at other things and other reasons. But I think right there is where we need to always begin. God can be silent because we make no time for him. If I went to you individually and asked each of you, tell me about your prayer life, you know the main thing I would hear from you? The majority of you, the main thing I'd hear from you, well, it's not what it should be. So what you're doing is you're saying, I have an excuse why I'm not praying, but I guess I'm saved by grace, so it doesn't matter with God. But really what you're saying is God is not important enough to give yourself to prayer. He's not important enough to take time out every day to sit at his feet, to seek his face. You think other things are more important, and even yourself more important than God, so you don't take time in prayer, but you'd rather do all these other things that in the end have no value in eternity, but you do them because that's what you think is more important, and you reject or neglect God as a result. Why should he answer your prayers if you make no time for him? Because then our prayers are only prayers of saying, well, God, help me. And then if he were to help, you go on and keep doing the same thing you've been doing. And so what happens, he starts going silent. He says, you only cry out to me when you're in need. You don't cry out to me because you want me. You don't cry out to me because you want fellowship and you want to know me. You cry out only out of selfish desires, out of need, and not out of longing desire for me. That's a serious thing. Much more serious than people understand. God is silent, and it ties right into the issue of, of prayer. He's silent because we're not willing to surrender to him. Prayerlessness is an expression of lack of surrender in the Christian life. Do you understand? That's what it is. Prayerlessness is evidence 
of lack of surrender. That you've come to a point, you say, well, I'm a Christian, I prayed the sinner's prayer, you know, I go to church, I give my tithes, I do these particular things, but beyond that, I'm not going to do anything. That's my life, I'm going to live my life, my way, this little bit of my life, I will give to God, but I don't want to surrender anymore. And prayerlessness proves the lack of surrender. So if he answered your prayers and you're not willing to surrender to him, it would just keep you in your prayerlessness, in your unwillingness to surrender. You would stay in that same compromise then. He's silent sometimes because we're not desperate. This is what's going on with this woman. She's not desperate. Jesus is going to help her to get desperate. And in that desperation is going to be an increase of faith. He is longing to answer her prayer. You understand? She is, he is longing to. He wants to cast that devil out of that little girl. But he, got, he has to bring mama to a place of desperation where faith rise up and will lay hold of the promise. He's, he is purposely going to be doing this as we see what goes on. It begins with his silence. But yet how much of the church is not desperate for him? Not desperate. There again, one huge evidence of not being desperate is lack of prayer. The absence of surrender. Busyness in life over that which is meaningless. The disciples went to Jesus because she's making all this noise. And though the scriptures don't say it, she, I believe she kept crying out. And, well, it does say it actually a little further on. It does say that she keeps crying out after us. But um, what they ended up saying here is uh, to Jesus, send her away. She keeps crying out after us. Oh, it's right there. <laughs> all right. And, um, you know, she's making a real ruckus there. Jesus trying to relax whatever other disciples and apostles were trying to from the hecticness of, of ministry. And now this woman is making a big ruckus. She is loud. She's boisterous. She's crying out to Jesus. And the disciples did not understand Jesus or his purpose. Send her away. Did Jesus come? It says, for the Son of Man came to send people away. Doesn't say that. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost, right? They didn't understand why he came. They didn't understand his mission, that he was coming to be the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. They didn't comprehend that. But they should have by this time understood the mercy and compassion of Christ. I mean, Jesus oozed with compassion, that's what his whole ministry was all about, touching multitudes. That's why you have times where it tells us in the Gospels that he healed every person in the multitude. Did they all have faith? No. He was just being merciful and kind and revealing to them who he was that they might enter into fellowship with him. They didn't understand who Jesus was, his purpose. And, of course, they did not have compassion. Now, isn't that strange? You'd be with Jesus all this time, however long it's been, a year, year and a half, whatever exactly the time frame might be with this, and they still had no compassion. Following Jesus was still all about them. Man, that takes a long time to get that out. You understand, that doesn't happen, and that doesn't happen in a day and a year. I mean, even when you come to the end where Jesus is crucified and resurrected, they're still full of themselves. Pentecost helped tremendously with that. But this was a long, hard road that they had to go through to try and start learning how to overcome this self-life and the selfishness and the self-absorption and all the other things that are there. So now you come to the second opposition. She keeps crying out, and he finally goes and says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And what had happened here is she somehow broke through the line of those who were trying to keep her away, and she fell at the feet of Jesus. That's a good place to be, right? Good place to be. And so she said, Lord, help me. You know, all I can imagine that she is looking at him with pleading eyes. Pain. I guarantee you he saw inside of her. He saw what was inside of her. He saw the pain. And he wanted to do something about that pain. He wanted to touch the woman at, at that very point. He wanted to heal her and her daughter. But she wasn't desperate enough yet. 
So he was going to help her. Now, can you imagine if, uh, if somebody from some European country came in here and pastor's praying for people up here and, and this person's there and he comes up to this person and says, I'm not praying for you. I don't pray from, for anybody that is not an American. I mean, what, do you, what, would you, what would you say to that? What would you say? Would you say pastor was being loving or would you say that he was being selfish or cruel or bigoted? What do you think that person would do? That, would that person stay? Or do you think that person would march out of here with an attitude and everybody that person saw that day and probably days, maybe weeks, months after would speak of how despicable this church is and how despicable the pastor is, right? Isn't that how we would respond? And if they were on Facebook or any other social media, they would, of course, blast the church. Blast it. Because that's how we work today. If we're angry, we instantly let the anger out on Facebook or some kind of social media and let everybody know how mad we are. I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. But she had an attitude that was persistent. She refused to be easily dissuaded. She refused to be driven away. Now, do you think there's something rising up in this woman that is going to produce the faith to believe for her daughter to be healed? That's what's going on here. He's trying to elevate this. The apostles and disciples didn't understand that. I don't even think the woman understood But she is just trying to persevere. She's just saying, I've got to have something. I've got to have something. I need what Jesus has to give me. Have you ever had that that persevering faith, that drive in you when opposition is coming against you that you refuse to give up and you continue persevering through until you get the answer? Have you ever had that in your life? Has it ever been something that defines you? And should it not be something that defines us, not just for a moment or not just over one issue, but shouldn't it define our faith that that's how we work, that we understand God is calling us to persevere through until an answer comes? And so most people would have left already. You understand? Most people would have left. Copped an attitude. But then it gets even worse. Okay, Lord, have mercy on me. And he's looking at her, looking in those eyes. And then he said this. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. That's a serious issue there. I don't know how many of you remember when the Gulf War began. And... uh, Bush was over in Afghanistan, I believe it was, and doing a, a, you know, a, a speech or whatever to a bunch of the press. And a man uh, took his shoe off and threw it at the president. And the president ducked. Didn't hit him. But the statement was said. The statement was said. And it went all over the Arab world. You know what that statement was? He took his shoe off and threw it at the president, which was an absolute despicable contempt for that man. It it was a despicable act. And everybody understood that he was insulting the president in that. The idea of dog in Jewish thought is not like what we have. They didn't have cute little lap pets. They didn't go and take their dog for a walk. They looked at dogs as contemptible things, things that they did not like, things that they did not want in their home. I pastored a Romanian church, and at that time, we had a little dog, a a Lhasa Apsa, which is a little fuzzy, well, kind of 25-pound fuzzy thing. And, uh, you know, they could not comprehend that we let that thing in the house. I mean, they they had no concept of it. You don't dog in the house? You don't have dogs in the house. So in that culture, to call her or refer to her as a dog was, in the mind of everybody, a very contemptible thing. Was he trying to degrade the woman? No, he wasn't. He was trying to stir her to the point of an act that she would believe, that she would have faith to believe. 
And so she responded. Says, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. But even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. You know, basically what she she was saying, she says, yes, I'm as if I'm a dog. I'm worthless. I'm good for nothing. I don't deserve your kindness. I don't deserve anything from you. But I'm not coming to you because I deserve. I'm coming because I need. She understood that she had lived a wicked life. She understood that she wasn't deserving of any kindness and compassion from Christ. She understood that. But she wasn't coming because she was a good woman. She was coming to Jesus because the need was great. God does not answer our prayers because we deserve it. None of us are ever going to be righteous enough to offer them. But he accepts the beggarly prayers that we offer up. And when they come from desperate, passionate hearts after him, he hears and he responds. And he is, the best I can say it, moved by it. God is moved by the by the desperation of those that begin to call out to him. There's something of power that's there, something that begins to move people, and as they're moved, it begins to move the heart of God, that God begins to respond. That's why when you look at every single revival that has ever broke out, you go beyond, go behind it, and you will see the prayer that was there. You'll see the desperation that was in the hearts of some people that would give God no rest, crying out day and night, It's the reality of what happens. It's the reality when people are growing so thirsty after God that they can't give them any rest. And that's what we need to become. That's what America needs. You know something that's really important with this? She said, yes, Lord, but even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. You know what she didn't do? She didn't blame another person. She didn't blame. They call that actually blame shifting in biblical counseling. Shifting the blame on another person. Well, I'm having the problems because of this person. I'm angry because of what they said. And I I, I do this because of that person. We have all these excuses for it. But nobody can make me sin. Nobody. Nobody. I sin because I choose to sin. I get angry because I choose to get angry. When people lust, is because they choose to lust. Nobody can make them do it. Sin, for it to be sin, is always willed by the individual. If it's not willed, then it is not sin. And so she didn't blame Jesus. She didn't blame her upbringing. She didn't blame her parents. She didn't blame her daughter. She didn't blame anybody. She took responsibility. And it is so easy to do the blame shifting, so easy. I mean, it comes just so natural. The very first sin that happens, just look at Adam and Eve, the blame shifting that begins right there. The first time guilt comes into into the world, they do blame shifting. The first time. Another thing that's really important here, I want you to hear this. She wasn't consumed with self-pity. Self-pity is a miserable, miserable thing that leads to depression. Self-pity. And I don't know, if you have a problem with self-pity, have you ever taken the time to see how self-pity makes the life of others miserable? Have you ever taken the time to see what it does to other people? Because self-pity is miserable, and it makes everybody else miserable. But, you know, when people get stuck in the self-pity, they want to have the self-pity and make everybody else miserable because they're miserable. It's selfish. I mean, it's utterly, completely selfish. And rather than going to Jesus say, deliver me from this self-pity, help me to have a thankful heart that I start praising you for the good you've done in my life and what you've given me, we become so consumed with self-pity, it drives us into depression. And as it drives us into depression, we hurt people more and more that we say we love. It's a terrible trap of what people get themselves into. But that's what happens unless people begin to see what they're doing and start saying, God, I need deliverance from, this own, from my own devil in this. Right? Because <laughs> that's what it is. It's a work of hell. 
in the life of a person that has helped that person develop a way of thinking and they're stuck in that way of thinking and they need a spiritual revolution such as Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 tells us to give our lives as a living sacrifice and be not conformed anymore to this world, but let the transforming of your mind take place. That's what's needed. And you know, your mind is not going to take place by osmosis. It's not going to take place because you sit in the Lazy Boy recliner watching stuff on TV that is either just a waste of your life or absolutely evil. It's only going to happen because you are making a conscious choice saying, God, something has to seriously change. There are five things that were in this woman that are very notable that brought about the results that she was really looking for. The first thing, and this set everything in motion, okay, this set everything in motion. The first thing is she became desperate for Jesus. She came to the point to realize there was no other remedy, no other answer, no, no other answer in any other place, by any other person, by anything else. The answer is Christ and Christ alone. And I want to say this in a right way, but how many times have people wanted an answer in life and they supposedly didn't get it at one church, so they go to another church to get it from that church, and then that church doesn't do it, so they go to another church and they just do church hopping because they're looking for a church to have the answer rather than Christ. The church is to be the messenger that brings the message of deliverance to people, but the church can't do it. Only Jesus delivers. Only Jesus forgives. Only Jesus can revolutionize life. Only he can do it. Only he can take all the junk that we've let get into our life to define us, and only he can deliver us from it and create something new inside of us. The promise that comes out from the Old Testament that's prophetic about the the new covenant that he will give us a new heart and a new mind. And when our heart is still old and ugly and filled with sin, when our mind is consumed with selfishness and all the other junk, then we, need, we are a, a perfect candidate for a spiritual revolution. But we've got to see the need of that spiritual revolution and be willing to go to Jesus and cry out for that revolution. Cry out for that work to give us a new heart, a new mind. God, I got an ugly heart. I got an ugly mind. I think ugly things, and my heart loves nothing that is good but only myself and my self-absorption. When we begin to do that, then God can begin to change things because we're starting to acknowledge where the problem is, and we stop blaming others. We start realizing the problem is with me. It's my, with my way of thinking. It's with my whole concept of who you are and what it means to be a Christian. God, I need a spiritual revolution here. The second thing she did is she humbled herself, just like I said. But what is, what is humility? If I'm going to make this really, really simple, humility is a right knowledge about God and ourselves. We exalt him, we bring ourselves down. It's not the self-depreciation, self-brutal type of thing, but it is understanding I'm a creature, I'm a sinner in need of a savior, I can't save myself. I can't rescue myself from the sin and the things I got myself into. I need God's help. And we bring ourselves to the place to begin to understand that we are in desperate need of him and we elevate him and know that he's the only remedy. We look to nothing else then. We see nothing else as a possibility but him. The next thing that she did is she acknowledged that Jesus was right. Now that can be very painful because you know what that acknowledgement is? My sin is absolutely evil. Do we want to admit that? Do we, do we want to admit your sin, my sin? Okay, we can go and say their sin out there, that, that sin out there. Those, what they do out there, that's wicked. But do we see that our sin is just as wicked as their sin? That in 1 John we're told that all sin is lawlessness, all sin, the sin of a non-Christian and the sin of a Christian is lawlessness. All of it is rebellion, all of it, no matter what name we give it. It may seem little, it may seem big, whatever it is, but all sin is of that same spirit. It's lawlessness, rebellion against the lawgiver that called us into fellowship with him, to know him. And so it's acknowledging that he's right, that there is no other Savior, that I need deliverance from me, that I need forgiveness, that I need a spiritual revolution. You know what else is going on? During this whole process, though she might not have processed it or even understood what was happening, Jesus was moving her along. Jesus was moving her along a path here, okay? She was beginning to surrender to Jesus. That's what Jesus was out after. 
to bring her to a place of surrender, to stop the rebellion, to get out of her paganism, to find deliverance from all the false religions and views that she had, and to begin to understand that there is a Savior in Israel, that there is one that can truly deliver because he has the power to deliver. And so she was surrendering, which is the only right response. You see, if we understand who he is, there's only one right response, the reckless abandonment of our life. Only one right response, that's it. Half-hearted devotion has no place in biblical Christianity. That is of dead religion. That's what we make of ourselves. But that's not what, what the true faith is. The true faith is on fire, it's hot, it's burning, it has zeal, it has passion. Because we understand then who Jesus is. We understand what he's calling us to, what he wants. And so this surrendering to Jesus, okay, this is tough here is the call to choose the death of our self-sufficiency. The call to crucify our right to do what we want to do, the way we want to do it, whenever we want to do it. That we crucify this self-sufficiency. That we crucify this thing that we rely upon ourselves. We got the plan and we know what we want in life. And I'm going to seek after it. I'm going to go get it. We begin to crucify that because we understand that my plan is going to be contrary to what God's plan is. And if I go after my plan, I'm going to, in the process of going after my plan, be at war with God. And so she acknowledged Jesus was right, she was surrendering to him, and she was willing to crucify her self-sufficiency. And then we see that she had prevailing faith. She would not be denied. How many times have we failed to see God answer a prayer because we did not have that attitude of persevering saints, of persevering faith? You know, Jesus went and gave the parable of this persistent widow. Kept going to the court. I'm not going to take the time to go through that. But he taught that parable to teach them how to continue to pray. And that such persistent prayer is an expression of faith. Of that will not give God any rest until he answers that prayer. And it's not just I'm going to claim a, a, a Mercedes. It's not the prosperity gospel that's a lie. It is praying according to his will and knowing that his heart is right here. And if I pray according to his heart and if I give him no rest, he will answer that prayer because it's in keeping with his heart. It's in keeping with his will. And he's looking for us to have that. This kind of persevering faith is so important. We know this verse very well, but we've got to really understand how powerful and how strong a verse it is. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and and rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so the only way we can be pleasing to God is we've got to have faith that believes that he is who he says he is according to the word of God and that we believe that he will do what he said he will do in our own life and in the lives of others. If we're not willing to, to have faith, then can I imply something here that's very... I think it's very obvious, if we take the obvious conclusion here, if we don't have that kind of persevering faith, then we're not pleasing to him. And I'll tell you what, when I stand before Jesus, the words I long to hear more than anything is well done. And if that's what you want, if you want those words, well done, my good and faithful servant, if you want him standing at the right hand of the Father, like he did with Stephen to receive the first martyr, if you want him standing there waiting with arms outstretched to say, well done, then are you living in such a way for that to happen? Are you doing what is necessary for that to become a reality in your life? Because that's really what needs to become the passion then of our life, that whatever we do, we're looking for the well done. Do you know how that can revolutionize your life? I'm saying this because, because this is something that, that some years ago I started doing. I started really paying attention, and I started really thinking about whenever I go through a hard time or whatever, some difficulty or something's rising up, then I try to say, God, I want the well done. What does it mean for the well done at the end of this? How do I do this in a way that's pleasing to you? And do you know how that changes the things you go through? Because now you're wanting the well done with each situation, whether small or big. I want the well done, God. What, 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 what will please you here? How can I do this in a way that's acceptable, that brings joy to your heart? Where great faith is wanted, there'll always be great tests. 
And this is why so many times we don't want great faith because we don't want to go through the great tests. But you know, when you have testimonies that come from people, I'm talking about great men and women of God, they give testimonies what God has done. You will always find in those great testimonies great needs. But they put their life in place that there would be great need because they were trying to do a great work for God and that great work for God caused there to be great needs and they were willing to believe that God would do something. What would happen to the church if we began to really believe? What would happen? I really love, and I'm going to close with, uh, with the answer in just a second, but I really love what Tozer said about faith. He said, faith is the gaze of the soul upon a saving God. Faith is gazing at him, looking at him, adoring him, consumed with him. Your heart, the eyes of your heart are fixed on him, like Hebrews tells us, fix your eyes on Jesus. And so she got the answer. What did Jesus say? Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. But what happened? He was changing mama first. He was changing mama first. So that when mom went home, she would be a different woman. And she would find her baby well, back in san insanity. But Mama now would live very different and not open up those doors to hell in her home again. Father, we come before you now in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Lord, we'll never have great faith until we're desperate for you and desperate to do something for you and desperate to give our lives away and Desperate that your name would be glorified and desperate to hear well done. Lord, if I might ask a gift upon this church, Lord, I would ask the gift of a holy desperation. I would ask a gift upon the congregation of people that would grow desperate and the desperation demonstrated in lives of prayer when no one's watching and in lives of prayer in the church and Lord, from one another's house, just this prayerfulness that just rises up because we are so desperate, we cannot do this work. And this work that you called us to do, you called the church to do, is more noble and glorious than we could ever imagine. It is to be your ambassadors to a dying world, to bring to them the message that there is a Savior that can rescue them from their sin. Lord, we have this glorious message, this glorious God that we are to proclaim to a perishing world. And Lord, we should be people so desperate in wanting to get your name out there that we're crying out day and night for the opportunities, looking for any opportunities and doing all that we can that your name would be exalted. Because one day when we stand before you, we want you a smile on your face. We want to hear well done. We want your embrace, O oh God. So Lord, I'm asking for awakening that would take place in your people. A holy desperation. Lord, you are attracted to weakness. And not weakness that gives over to sin, but weakness that sees the need. Because, Lord, you will not resist those who humbly and honestly admit how much they desperately need you. God, bring us to that place, O oh Lord. In the precious name of Jesus.